Agricultural Distress by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Anthony Gerges One Sunday morning, service done, Mongst the tombstones shining in the sun, A knot of bumpkins stood to chat, Of that and this, and this and that, What people said of Polly Hatch, And which side had won the cricket match, And who was cotched, and who was bold, And how barley, beans, and taters sold, What men could swallow at a meal, when Bumpstead youths would ring a peal, and who was taken off to jail, and where they brewed the strongest ale. At last this question they address, What's agricultural distress? Hodge For me part, it's a thought of mine, it be the fancy farming line, like yonder gemmin, him I mean, as took the willa nigh the green, and turned his cattle in the wheat, and gave his porkers hay to eat, and sent his footman up to town to ax the London gentry down to be so kind as make his hay exactly on St. Swithin's day. The consequences you may guess, that's agricultural distress. Dickon, last Monday morning, Master Blog comed for to stick our bacon hog, but the hog he cocked a knowing eye as if he twigged the reason why and dodged and dodged in such a dance he didn't give the noose a chance so master blog at last lays off and shams a rattle at the trough then swish in boats our bacon hog atwixt the legs of master blog and flops him down in all the muck as hadn't been swept up by the luck now that according to my guess be agricultural distress Giles. Nay, that ain't it, I tell ye flat, I's bring a worse a case nor that. Last Friday week I take a start to reading with a horse and cart. Well, when I set the taters down, I meet a crony at the crown. And what betwixt the ale and tom, it's dark afore I start a home. So weeping hard by long and late, at last we reach nigh the gate. And sure enough, there must stand, a lantern flaying in his hand. Why, Giles, says he, what's that I hear? Your chestnut horse beat my bay mare. He beat not worth a leg of bess. There's agricultural distress. Hob. That's nothing yet to Tom's mishap, a gooding through the yard, poor chap, only to fetch his milking pails when he shies like head or tails nor would the bull let tom a be till he had tossed the best of three and there lies tom with broken bones a surgeon's job for dr jones well dr jones lays down the law there's two cracked ribs besides a jaw eat well says he stuff out your case for that will keep the ribs in place but how was tom poor chap to chow saying how he'd broke his jaw that's summit to pint yes yes that's agricultural distress simon while well, turn and turn about is fair tom's bad enough and so's the mare but nothing to my load of hay you see twas hard on quarter day and cash was wanted for the rent so up to london i was sent to sell a prime a load of hay as ever dried on summer's day while well, standing in Whitechapel Road, a chap comes up to buy my load, and looks and looks about the cart, pretending to be cute and smart. But no great judge, as people say, cause why? He never smelt the hay. Thinks I, as he's a simple chap, he'll give a simple price, mayhap. Such buyer comes but now and then, so slap I axes, put nine pun ten. That's dear, says he, and pretty quick, he taps his leathers with his stick suppose says he we wet our clay just while we bargain bout the hay so in we goes my chap and me he drinks to i and i to he at last says i a little gay it's time to talk about that hay nine pound says he and i'm your man live and let live for that's my plan that's true says i but still i say it's nine pun ten for that ere hay and so we chaffers for a bit at long and last the odds we split and off he sets to show the way where up a yard i leaves the hay then from the pocket of his coat he pulls a book and picks a note that's ten says he i hope to pay ten upon tens for loads of hay 
with all my heart and soon says i and feeling for the change thereby but all my shillings come to five says he no matter man alive there's something in your honest fizz i trust if twice the sum it is you'll pay next time you come to town as sure says i as corn is brown all right says he thinks i huzzay he's got no bargain of the hay well home i goes with empty carts whipping the horses pretty smart and whistling every yard away to think how well i'd sold the hay and just cotched masters at his greens and bacon or it might be beans which didn't taste the worst sure lie to hear his hay had gone so high but lord when i laid down the note it struck the victuals in his throat and choked him till his face all grew like pickling cabbage red and blue with such big goggle eyes on snails they seem a coming out like snails a note says he half mad with passion why thou damn fool thou's took a flashin now wasn't that a pretty mess that's agricultural distress colin foo foo you're nothing near the thing you only argy in a ring cause why you never cares to look like me in any learned book but school arts know the wrong and right of everything in black and white well farming that's its common name and agriculture be the same so put your farming first and next distress and there you have your text but here the question comes to press what farming be and what's distress why farming is to plough and sow weed harrow harvest reap and mow thrash winnow sell and buy and breed the proper stock to fat and feed distress is want and pain and grief and sickness things as wants relief thirst hunger age and cold severe in short ax any overseer well now the logic for to chop where's the distress about a crop there's no distress in keeping sheep i like to see em frisk and leap there's no distress in seeing swine grow up to pork bacon fine there's no distress in growing wheat and grass for men or beasts to eat and making of lean cattle fat there's no distress of course in that then what remains but one thing more and that's the farming of the poor hodge dickon giles hob and simon yeah ay surely for certain yes that's agricultural distress end of poem this recording is in the public domain domestic poems by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by anthony gurgis domestic poems it's haim 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 a cunningham there is no place like home clary one hymenial retrospections oh kate my dear partner through joy and through strife when i look back at hymen's dear day not a lovelier bride was ever changed to a wife though now you're so old wizened and gray those eyes then were stars shining rulers of fate but as liquid as stars in a pool though now they're so dim they appear my dear kate just like gooseberries boiled for a fool that brow was like marble so smooth and so fair though it's wrinkled so crookedly now as if time when those furrows were made by the share had been tipsy whilst driving his plough your nose it was such as the sculptors all chose when a venus demanded their skill though now it can hardly be reckoned a nose but sort of a paul parody bill your mouth it was then quite a bait for the bees such a nectar there hung on each lip though now it has taken that lemon-like squeeze not a blue bottle comes for a sip your chin it was one of love's favorite haunts from its dimple he could not get loose though now the neat hand of a barber it wants or a single like the breast of a goose how rich were those locks so abundant and full with their ringlets of auburn so deep though now they only look like frizzles of wool by a bramble torn off from a sheep that neck not a swan could excel in its grace while in whiteness it vied with your arms though now a grave handkerchief you properly place to conceal that scrag end of your charms your figure was tall then and perfectly straight though now it has to twist from upright but bless you still bless you my partner my kate though you be such a perfect old fright two 
The sun was slumbering in the west, my daily labors passed. On Anna's soft and gentle breast my head reclined at last. The darkness closed around so dear to fond congenial souls, and thus she murmured at my ears, My love, we're out of coals. That Mr. Bond has called again, insisting on his rent, and all the Todds are coming up to see us out of Kent. I quite forgot to tell you, John, he has had a tipsy fall. I'm sure there's something going on with that vile Mary Hall. Miss Bell has brought the sweetest silk, and I have brought the rest. Of course, if we go out of town, Southend will be the best. I really think that Jones's house would be the thing for us. I think I told you Mrs. Pope has parted with her nuss cook by the way came by to-day to bid me suit myself and what do you think the rats have not the victuals on the shelf and lord there's such a letter come inviting you to fight of course you don't intend to go god bless you dear good night three a parental ode to my son aged three years and five months thou happy happy elf but stop first let me kiss away that tear thou tiny image of myself my love, he's poking peas into his ear. Thou merry laughing sprite, with spirit's feather light, untouched by sorrow and unsoiled by sin. Good heavens, the child is swallowing a pin. Thou little tricksy puck, with antic toys so funnily be stuck, light as the singing bird that wings the air. The door, the door, he'll tumble down the stair. Thou darling of thy sire, why, Jane, he'll set his pinafone on fire. Thou imp of mirth and joy, in love's dear chain so strong and bright a link, thou idol of my parents, drat the boy, there goes my ink. Thou cherub, but of the earth, fit playfellow for fays by moonlight pale, in harmless sport and mirth, that dog will bite him if he pulls its tail. Thou human honey bee extracting honey from every blossom in the world that blows, singing in youth's elysium ever sunny another tumble and that's his precious nose thy father's pride and hope he'll break the mirror with that skipping rope with pure heart newly stamped from nature's mint where did he learn that squint thou young domestic dove he'll have that jug off with another shove dear nursling of the hymeneal nest are those torn clothes his best little epitome of man he'll climb upon the table and that's his plan touched with the beauteous tints of dawning life he's got a knife thou enviable being no storms no clouds in thy blue sky foreseeing play on play on my elfin john toss the light ball bestride the stick i knew so many cakes would make him sick with fancies buoyant as the thistle down prompting the face grotesque and antic brisk with many a lamb-like frisk he's got the scissors snipping at your gown thou pretty opening rose go to your mother child and wipe your nose balmy and breathing music like the south he really brings my heart to my mouth fresh as the morn and brilliant as a star i wish that window had an iron bar bold as the hawk yet gentle as the dove i'll tell you what love i cannot write unless he's sent above four a serenade lullaby o oh lullaby thus i heard a father cry lullaby o oh lullaby that brat will never shut his eye hither come some power divine close his lids or open mine lullaby o oh lullaby what the devil makes him cry lullaby o oh lullaby still he stares i wonder why why are not the sons of earth blind like poppies from the birth lullaby o oh lullaby thus i heard the father cry lullaby o oh lullaby mary you must come and try hush oh hush for mercy's sake the more i sing the more you wake lullaby oh lullaby fie you little creature fie lullaby oh lullaby is no poppy syrup nigh give him some or give him all i am nodding to his fall lullaby oh lullaby to such nights and i shall die lullaby oh lullaby he'll be bruised and so shall i how can i from bedposts keep when i'm waking in my sleep lullaby oh lullaby sleep his very looks deny lullaby o oh, lullaby nature soon will stupefy my nerves relax my eyes grow dim who's that fallen me or him end of poem this recording is in the public domain
The Green Man by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Anthony Gerges The Green Man Tom Simpson was as nice a kind of man as ever lived at least at number four, and Austin Friars in Mrs. Brown's first floor, at fifty pounds or thereabouts per ann. The lady reckoned him her best of lodgers, his rent so punctually paid each quarter. He did not smoke like nasty foreign codgers, or play French horns like Mr. Rogers, or talk his flirting nonsense to her daughter, not that the girl was light-behaved or courtable. Still, on one failing tenderly to touch, the gentleman did like a drop too much, though there are many as such and took more port than was exactly portable in fact to put the cap upon the nipple and try the charge tom certainly did tipple he thought the motto was but sorry stuff on cripp's prize cup yes wrong in every letter that deed be he who first cries hold enough the more cups hold and if enough the better and so to set example in the eyes of fancy lads and give a broadish hint to them all his cups were of such ample size that he got into them once in the company of merry mates in spite of temperance ifs and buts so sure as eating is set off with plates as drinking always was bound up with cuts how be it such bacchanalian revels bring such sad catastrophes about palsy dyspepsy dropsy and blue devils not to forget the gout sometimes the liver takes a spleenful whim to grow to Strasburg's regulation size as if for those hepatical goose pies or out of depth the head begins to swim poor simpson what a thing occurred to him twas christmas he had drunk the night before like baxter who so went beyond his last one bottle more and then one bottle more till oh the red wine rubicon was passed and homeward by the short small chimes of day with many a circumbedibus to spare for instance twice round the finsbury square to use a fitting phrase he wound his way then comes the rising with repentance bitter and all the nerves and sparrows in a twitter till settled by the sober chinese cup the hands over all are members that make motions a sort of wavering just like the oceans which has its swell too when it's getting up an awkward circumstance enough for elves who shave themselves and simpson was just ready to go through it when lo the first short glimpse within the glass he jumped and who alive would fail to do it to see however it had come to pass one section of his face was green as grass in vain each eager wipe with soap without wet hot or cold or dry still still and still to his astonished eye one cheek was green and the other cherry ripe plump in the nearest chair he sat down quaking and quite absorbed in a deep study but verdant and not brown what could have happened to a tint so ruddy indeed it was a very novel case by way of penalty for being jolly to have that evergreen stuck in his face just like the windows with their christmas holly all claret marks thought he tom knew his fort are red this colour cannot come from the port one thing was plain with such a face as his twas quite impossible to ever greet good mrs brown nay nay any party meet although twas such a party-coloured fizz as for the public fancy sarcy ned the coachman flying dog-like at his head with ax your pardon sir but if you please unless it comes too high where ought the feller now to go to buy the t'other half sir of their green cheese his mind recoiled so he tied up his head as with a raging tooth and took to bed of course his feelings far from the serene for all his fortune prospects seemed to be to match his customary tea black mixed with green meanwhile good mrs brown wondered at mr s not coming down and sent the maid upstairs to learn the why to whom poor simpson half delirious returned an answer so mysterious that curiosity began to fry the more as betty who had caught a snatch by peeping in upon the patient's bed reported a most bloody tied-up head got overnight of course harm watch harm catch from watchman in a boxing match so liberty or not good lodgers are too scarce to let him off in a suicidal coffin the dame ran up as fast as she could trot appearance fiddlesticks should not deter from going to the bed and looking at his head la mr s he need not to care for her a married woman that had had nine boys and gals and none had turned out bad her own dear late would come home late at night and liquor always got him in a fight 
she'd been in hospital she wouldn't faint at gores and gashes fingers wide and deep she knew what's good for bruises and what ain't turlington's drops she made a pint to keep cases she'd been beneath the surgeon's hand such skulls japan she meant to say trepanned poor wretches you would think they'd been in a battle and had an hours to live from tearing horses kicks or smithlin cattle shamefully overdriv heads forced to have a silver plate atop to get the brains to stop at imputations of the like she'd seen and neither screeched nor cried hereat she plugged the white caravet aside and lo the whole phenomenon was seen preserve us all he's going to gangrene alas through simpson's brain shot the remark like a ball with mortal pain it tallied truly with its own misgiving and brought a groan to move a heart of stone a sort of farewell to the land of the living and as case was imminent and urgent he did not make a shadow of objection to mrs b's proposal for a surgeon but merely gave a sigh of deep dejection while down the verdant cheek of a tear of grief stole like a dewdrop on a cabbage leaf swift flew the summons it was life or death and in as short a time as he could erase it came dr puttycomb assured of breath to try his latin charms against hic jacet he took his seat beside the patient's bed saw tongue fault pulse examined the bad cheek poked stroked pinched kneaded it hemmed it shook his head took a solemn pause to think to seek thinking it seemed in greek then asked twas christmas had he eaten grass or greens and if the cook was so improper to boil them up with copper or farthings made of brass and if he drank his hawk from dark green glass or dined at city festivals whereat there's turtle and green fat to all of which with a serious tone of woe poor simpson answered no indeed he might have said in a form arculiar supposing puttycomb had been a monk he had not eaten he had only drunk of anything particular the doctor was at fault a thing so new quite brought him to a halt cases of other colours came in crowds he could have found the remedy and soon but green it sent him up the clouds as if he had gone up with green's balloon black with black jaundice he had seen the skin from yellow jaundice yellow from saffron tints to sallow then retrospective memory lugged in old purple face the host at kentish town east indians without number he knew familiarly by heat done brown from tan to a burnt umber even those eruptions he had never seen of which the caledonian poet spoke as rashes growing green foo foo a rash grow green nothing of course but a broad scottish joke then as to flaming visages for those the scarlet fever answered o'er the rose but vendon that was quite a novel stroke men turned to blue by cholera's last stage in common practice he had really seen but green he was too old and grave and sage to think of the last stage to turn him green so matters stood indoors meanwhile without growing and going like all other rumours the modern miracle was buzzed about by people of all humours native or foreign in their dialectals till all the neighbourhood as if their noses had taken the odd girls from little moses seemed looking through green spectacles green faces so they all began to comment yes opposite to druggists lighted shops but that's a flying colour never stops a bottle green that's vanished in a moment green nothing of the sort occurs to mind nothing at all to match the present piece jack in the green has had nothing of the kind green grocers are not green nor are green geese the old supercargoes or old sailors of such a case has never been heard from esmeralda island to cape de verde or greenland cried the whalers all tongues were full of the green men and still they could not make out with all their skill no soul could shape the matter head or tail but truth steps in where all conjectures fail a long half hour in needless puzzles our galen's cane had rubbed against his muzzles he thought and thought and thought and thought and thought and still it came to naught when up rushed betty loudest of town criers lord ma'am the police is at the door it be ma'am twenty-four as brought home mr s to austin friars and said there's nothing but a simple case he got that ere green face by sleeping in the kennel near the dyers end of poem this recording's in the public domain hit or miss by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by anthony gurgis to the dogs that were in a thrang at home for gathered once upon a time burns one morn it was the very morn september's sportive month was born the hour about the sunrise early the sky grey sober still and pearly with sundry orange streaks and tinges through daylight's door at cracks and hinges the air combracing freshly pool as if just skimmed off from a pool 
the scene red russet yellow laden from stubble fern and leaves that daden save here and there a turnip patch too verdant with the rest to match and far afield a hazy figure some roaming lover of the trigger meanwhile the level light perchance picked out his barrel with a glance for all around a distant poppin told birds were flyin off for droppin such was the morn a morn right fair to seek for covey or for hare when lo too far from human feet for even rangers boldest beat a dog as in some doggish trouble came cantering through the crispy stubble with dappled head in lowly droop but not the scientific stoop and flagging dull desponding ears as if they had been soaked in tears and not the bee did do that hung the filmy stalks and weeds among his pace indeed seemed not to know an errand why or where to go to trot to walk or scamper swift in short he seemed a dog adrift his very tail a listless thing with just an accidental swing like rudder to the ripple veering when nobody on board is steering so dull and moody cantered on our vagrant pointer christened don when rising over a gentle slope that gave his view a better scope he spied some dozen furrows distance but in a spot as inconsistent a second dog across his track without a master to his back as if for wages workmanlike the sporting breed had made a strike resolved nor birds nor puss to seek without another poncho week this was a truant curly but for a spaniard wondrous surely instead of curvettes gray and brisk he slouched along without a frisk with dogged air as if he had a good half mind to running mad mayhap the shaking at his ear had been a quaver too severe mayhap the whip's exclusive dealing had too much hurt in spaniel feeling nor if he had been cut twas plain he did not mean to come again of course the pair soon spied each other but neither seemed to own a brother the course on both sides stood a curve as dogs when shy are apt to swerve but each o'er back and shoulder throwing a look to watch the other going till having cleared sufficient ground with one accord they turned them around and squatting down for forms not caring at one point fell to staring as if not proof against the touch of what plagues humankind so much a prying itch to get at notions of all their labours looks and motions sir don at length was first to rise the better dog in point of size and snuffing all around between set off with easy jaunty mien while dash the stranger rose to greet him and made a dozen steps to meet him their noses touched and rubbed a while some savage nations use the style and then their tails a wag began though on a very cautious plan but in their signals quantum stuff to say a civil dog enough thus having held out olive branches they sank again though not on haunches but cushioned with their under jaws resting between the two forepaws the prelude on a luckier day or sequel to a game of play but now they were in dumps and thus began their worries to discuss the pointer coming to the point the first on time so out of joint well friend so here's a new september as fine a first as i remember and thanks to such an early spring plenty of birds and strong on wind birds cried the other still crusty chap as sharp and sudden as a snap a weasel suck em in the shell what matter birds are flying well or fly at all or sporting weather if fools with guns can't hit a feather ay there's rub indeed said don putting his gravest visage on in vain we beat our beaten way and bring our organs into play unless the proper killing kind of barrel tunes are played behind but then we shoot that's me and squire we hit as often as we fire more luck for you cried little woolly who felt the cruel contrast fully more luck for you and squire to boot we miss as often as we shoot indeed no wonder you're unhappy i thought you looking rather snappy but fancied when i saw you jogging you'd have an overdose of flogging or perhaps the gun its range had tried while you were ranging rather wide me running running wide and hit me shot what pepper deuce a bit i almost wish i had that dunce my master then would hit for once hit me lord how you talk why zounds he couldn't hit a pack of hounds well that must be a case provoking what never but you dog you're joking i'd see a sort of wicked grin about your jaw you're keeping in 
a joke an old tin kettle's clatter would be as much a joking matter to tell the truth that dog disaster is just the type of me and master when fagging over hill and dale with his vain rattle at my tail bang bang and bang the whole day's run but leading nothing but his gun the very shot i fancy hisses it sent upon such awful misses of course it does but perhaps the fact is your master's hand is out of practice practice no doctor where you will has finer but he cannot kill these three years past through furs and furrow all covers i have hunted thorough flushed cocks and snipes about the moors and put up hares by scopes and scores coveys of birds and lots of pheasants yes game enough to send in presents to every friend he has in town provided he had knocked it down but no the whole three years together he hasn't given me a flick or feather and all that i have had to do i wish i had been missing too well such a hand would drive me mad but is he truly quite so bad bad worse you can't undersore him if i could put up just before him the great balloon that paid the visit across the water he would miss it bite him i do believe indeed it's in his very blood and breed it marks his life and run all through it that what can be missed he's sure to do it last monday he came home to tootin dog tired as if he's been a shootin and kicks at me to vent his strange get out he says i've missed the stage of course thought i what chance of hitting you'd miss the norwich wagon sitting why he must be the country's scoff he ought to leave and not let off as fate denies his shooting wishes why don't he take to catching fishes or any other sporting game that don't require a bit of aim not he some dogs of human kind will hunt by sight because they're blind my master angle no such luck there he might strike who never struck my master shoots because he can't and has an eye that aims a slant nay just by way of making trouble he's changed his single gun for double and now as girls a walk and do he misses go by two and two i wish he had the manger reason as good to miss the shooting season why yes it must be main unpleasant to point to covey or to pheasant for snobs who when the point is mooting think letting fly as good as shooting snobs if he'd wear his ruffled shirts or coats with water wagtail skirts or trousers in the place of smalls or those tight fit he wears at balls or pumps and boots with tops and mayhap why we might pass for snip and snap and shoot like blazes fly or sit and none would stare unless we hit but no to make more combustion he goes to gators and in fustion like captain ross or topping sparks and deuce amiss but some one marks for keepers shy of such and roachers dog us about like common poachers many's the covey i've gone by when underneath a sporting eye many a puss i've twigged in pasture i'd miss him to prevent my master and so should i in such a case there's nothing feels so like disgrace or give you such a scurvy look a kick and pail of slush from cook cleft six or kettle all in one a standing to a missing gun it's whirr and bang and off you bound to catch your bird before the ground but no a pump and ginger pop as soon would get the bird to drop and there you stand quite struck a heap till all your tail is gone to sleep a sort of stiffness in your nape holding your head well up to gape while off go birds across the ridges for smallest flies and then as midges cock sure as they are living chicks death's door is not at number six yes yes and then you look at master the cause of all the late disaster who gives the stamp and raps on oath at gun or birds or maybe both perhaps curses you and all your kin to raise your hair upon your skin then loads rams down and fits new caps to go and hunt for more mishaps yes yes but sick and sad you feel but one long wish to go to heel you cannot scent for cutting mugs your nose is turning up like pugs you can't hold up but plot and mope your tail like sodden end of rope that over a wind-bound vessel's side has soaked in harbour tide and tide on thorns and scratches till that moment unnoticed you begin to comment you never felt such bitter brambles such heavy soil in your rambles you never felt your fleas so vicious till sick of life so unpropitious you wish at last to end the passage that you were dead and in your sassage yes that's a miss from end to end but zounds you draw so well my friend you've made me shiver skin and gissel just as i heard my master's whistle though how you came to learn the knack i thought your squire was quite a crack 
and so he is he always hits and sometimes hard and all to bits but here him with our tongues we task i've still got one little thing to ask namely with such a random master of course you sometimes want to plaster such missing hands make game of more than ever passed for game before a pounded pig a widow's cat a patent ventilating hat for shot like mud when thrown so thick will find a coat whereon to stick what accidentals as they're termed no never none since i was wormed not even the keepers fattened calves my master does not miss by halves his shots are like poor orphans hurled abroad the whole wide world but whether they be blown to dust as oftentimes i think they must or melted down too near the sun what comes of them is known to none i never found since i could bark a barn that bore my master's mark is that the case why then my brother would we swap with one another or take the squire with all my heart nay all my liver so we part he'll hit your hairs he uses cartridge he'll hit your cocks he'll hit a partridge he'll hit a snipe he'll hit a pheasant he'll hit he'll hit whatever's present he'll always hit as that's your wish his pepper never lacks a dish come come you banter let's be serious i'm sure that i am half delirious your picture set me so a sign but does he shoot so well shoot flying shoot flying yes and running and walking i've seen him shoot two farmers talking he'll hit the game whenever he can but failing that he'll hit a man a boy a horse's tail or head or make a pig a pig of lead oh friend there's no dog as yet however hot was known to sweat but sure i am that i perspire sometimes before my master's fire misses no no he always hits but so as puts me into fits he shot my fellow dog this morning which seemed to me sufficient warning quite quite enough so that's a hitter why my own fate i thought was bitter and full excuse for cut and run but give me still the missing gun or rather serious send me this no gun at all to hit or miss since sporting seems to shoot thus double that right or left it brings us trouble so ended dash and pointer don prepared to urge the moral on but here a whistle long and shrill came sounding over the council hill and starting up as if their tails had felt the touch of shoe and nails away they scampered down the slope as fast as other pairs elope resolved instead of sporting rackets to beg or dance in fancy jackets at butcher shops to try their luck to help to draw a carter truck or lead stone blind poor men at most who would but hit or miss a post end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Forlorn Shepherd's Complaint by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. An unpublished poem from Sydney Fell, here I am, no matter how it suits a keeping company with them dumb brutes old park voss no bad judge confound his fig a voot would break the spirit of a prig the like of me to come to new sow wales to go a tagging arter fair's tales and valk in herbage as delights the flock but stinks of sweet herbs verser nor the dock to go to set this solitary job to von whose fork was alway in a mob it's out of our lines for sure i am jack shepherd even never kipped a lamb i aren't ashamed to say i sit and veep to think of seven year of keepin sheep the spooniest beast in nature all to sticks and not a watch to take for all their ticks if i'd foreseed how transports would turn out to only ba and botanize about i quite as lief have had the t'other pull and come to cotton as to all this fool von only happy moment i have had since here i come to be a farmer's cad and then i cotched a wild beast in a snooze and picked her pouch of three young kangaroos 
what chance hay i go to race or mill or show a sneaking kindness for a till and as for vashings on a hedge to dry i'd put the native's linen in my eye if this whole lot of mutton i could scrag and find a fence to turn it into swag i give it all in london streets to stand and if i had my pick i'd say the strand but ven i goes as maybe vaunts i shall to my old crib to meet with jack and sal i've been so gallows honest in this place i shan't not like to show my sheepish face it's weary hard for nothing but a box of irish backguard to be keepin flocks mong naked blacks sich savages to hus they've neither got a pocket nor a pus but folks may tell their troubles till they're sick to dumb brute beasts and so i'll cut my stick and vots the use a feller's eyes to pipe for von can't borrow any g man's vipe end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lieutenant Luff by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. All you that are too fond of wine, or any other stuff, take warning by the dismal fate of one Lieutenant Luff. A sober man he might have been, except in one regard he did not like soft water so he took to drinking hard said he let others fancy slops and talk in praise of tea but i am no bohemian so do not like bohe if wine's a poison so is tea though in another shape what matter whether one is killed by canister or grape according to this kind of taste did he indulge his drouth and being fond of port he made a porthole of his mouth a single pint he might have sipped and not been out of sorts in geologic phrase the rock he split upon was quartz to hold the mirror up to vice with him was hard alas the worst for wine he often was but not before a glass no kind and prudent friend had he to bid him drink no more the only checkers in his course were at the tavern door full soon the sad effects of this his frame began to show for that old enemy the gout had taken him in tow and joined with this an evil came of quite another sort for while he drank himself his purse was getting something short for want of cash he soon had pawned one half that he possessed and drinking showed him duplicates beforehand of the rest so now his creditors resolved to seize on his assets for why they found that his half-pay did not half-pay his debts but luff contrived a novel mode his creditors to chouse for his own execution he put into his own house a pistol to the muzzle charged he took devoid of fear said he this barrel is my last so now for my last beer against his lungs he aimed the slugs and not against his brain so he blew out his lights and none could blow them in again a jury for a verdict met 
and gave it in these terms we find as how a certain slugs had sent him to the worms end of poem this recording is in the public domain morning meditations by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by phil Schampf. let taylor preach upon a morning breezy how well to rise while nights and larks are flying for my part getting up seems not so easy by half as lying what if the lark does carol in the sky soaring beyond the sight to find him out wherefore am i to rise at such a fly i'm not a trout talk not to me of bees and such like hums the smell of sweet herbs at the morning prime only lee long enough and bed becomes a bed of time to me dan phoebus and his car are not his steeds that paw impatiently about let them enjoy say i as horses ought the first turn out right beautiful the dewy meads appear besprinkled by the rosy fingered girl what then if i prefer my pillow beer to early pearl my stomach is not ruled by other men's and grumbling for a reason quaintly begs wherefore should master rise before the hens have laid their eggs why from a comfortable pillow start to see faint flushes in the east awaken a fig say i for any streaky part excepting bacon an early riser mr gray has drawn who used to haste the dewy grass among to meet the sun upon the upland lawn well he died young with charwomen such early hours agree and sweeps that earn betimes their bit and sup but i'm no climbing boy and need not be all up all up so here i'll lie my morning calls deferring till something nearer to the stroke of noon a man that's fond precociously of stirring must be a spoon end of poem this recording is in the public domain a plain direction by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by drew conway twenty ninth of december two thousand and sixteen kent do you never deviate john bull in london once i lost my way in faring to and fro and asked a little ragged boy the way that i should go he gave a nod and then a wink and told me to get there straight down the crooked lane and all around the square i boxed his little saucy ears and then away i strode but since i found that weary path is quite a common road utopia is a pleasant place but how should i get there straight down the crooked lane and all around the square i've read about a famous town that drove a famous trade where whittington walked up and found a fortune ready made the very streets are paved with gold but how should i get there straight down the crooked lane and all around the square i've read about a fairy land in some romantic tale where dwarfs if good are sure to thrive and wicked giants fail my wish is great my shoes are strong but how should i get there straight down the crooked lane and all around the square i've heard about some happy isle where every man is free and none can lie in bonds for life for want of lsd oh that's the land of liberty but how should i get there straight down the crooked lane and all around the square i've dreamt about some blessed spot beneath the blessed sky where bread and justice never rise too dear for folks to buy it's cheaper than the ward of cheap but how should i get there straight down the crooked lane and all around the square they say there is an ancient house as pure as it is old where members always speak their minds and votes are never sold 
I'm fond of all antiquities, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane, and all around the square. They say there is a royal court, maintained in noble state, where every able man and good is certain to be great. I'm very fond of seeing sights, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane, and all around the square. They say there is a temple too, where Christians come to pray, but canting knaves and hypocrites, and bigots keep away. Oh, that's the parish church for me, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane, and all around the square. They say there is a garden fair that's haunted by the dove, where love of gold doth never clips the golden light of love. The place must be a paradise, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane, and all around the square. I've heard there is a famous land for public spirit known, where patriots love its interests much better than their own. The land of promise sure it is, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane and all around the square. I've read about a fine estate, a mansion large and strong, a view all over Kent and back and going for a song. George Robbins knows the very spot, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane and all around the square. I've heard there is a company, all formal and enrolled, will take your smallest silver coin and give it back in gold. Of course the office door is mobbed, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane and all around the square. I've heard about a pleasant land where omelettes grow on trees and roasted pigs run crying out, come eat me if you please. My appetite is rather keen, but how should I get there? Straight down the crooked lane and all around the square. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Assistant Draper's Petition by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Raj from California now is the time and now is the hour, Burns. Seven's the main, Crockford. Pity the sorrows of a class of men who, though they bow to fashion and frivolity, no fancied claims or woes fictitious pen, but wrongs yell wide and of a lasting quality. Oppressed and discontented with our lot, amongst the clamorous we take our station. A host of ribbon men, yet is there not one piece of Irish in our hesitation. We do revere Her Majesty the Queen. We venerate our glorious constitution. We joy King William's advent should have been and only want a counter-revolution. It's not Lord Russell and his final measure. It's not Lord Melbourne's counsel to the throne. It's not this bill or that gives us displeasure the measures we dislike are all our own the cash law the great western loves to name the tone our foreign policy pervading the corn laws none of these we care to blame our evils we refer to over trading by tax or tith our murmurs are not drawn we reverence the church but hang the clock we love her ministers but curse the lawn. We have, alas, too much to do with both. We love the sex, to serve them is a bliss. We trust they find us civil, never surly. All that we hope of female friends is this, that their last linen may be wanted early. Ah, we can tell the miseries of men that serve the very cheapest shops in town, till faint and weary, they leave off at ten, knocked up by ladies beating of them down. But has not Hamlet his opinion given? Oh, Hamlet had a heart for draper's servants. That custom is, 
say custom after seven more honored in the breach than the observance o oh, come then gentle ladies come in time overwhelm our counters and upload our shelves torment us all until the seventh chime but let us have the remnant to ourselves we wish of knowledge to lay in a stock and not remain in ignorance incurable to study shakespeare milton dryden locke and other fabrics that have proved so durable we long for thoughts of intellectual kind and not to go bewildered to our beds with stuff and fustian taking up the mind and pins and needles running in our heads for oh the brain gets very dull and dry selling from morn till night for cash or credit or with a vacant face and vacant eye watching cheap prints that night did never edit till sick with toil and lassitude extreme we often think when we are dull and vapory the bliss of paradise was so supreme because that adam did not deal in drapery end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Bachelor's Dream by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Linda Olson Fytuck, Los Angeles. The Bachelor's Dream. My pipe is lit, my grog is mixed, my curtains drawn, and all is snug. Old Puss is in her elbow chair, and Trey is sitting on the rug. Last night I had a curious dream. Miss Susan Bates was Mistress Mog. What do you think of that, my cat? What do you think of that, my dog? She looked so fair, she sang so well. I could but woo when she was one. Myself in blue, the bride in white, the ring was placed, the deed was done. Away we went in chaise and four, as fast as grinning boys could flog. <laughs> what do you think of that, my cat? What do you think of that, my dog? What loving tater tates to come, but tater tates must still defer. When Susan came to live with me, her mother came to live with her. With Sister Belle she couldn't part, but all my ties had leave to jog. What do you think of that, my cat? What do you think of that, my dog? The mother brought a pretty pole, a monkey too, what work he made. The sister introduced a bow. My Susan brought a favourite maid. She had a tabby of her own, a snuppish mongrel christened Gog. What do you think of that, my cat? What do you think of that, my dog? The monkey bit, the parrot screamed. All day the sister strummed and sung. The petted maid was such a scold. My Susan learned to use her tongue. Her mother had such wretched health, she sate and croaked like any frog. What do you think of that, my cat? What do you think of that, my dog? No longer, dearie ducky and love i soon came down to simple m the very servants crossed my wish my susan let me down to them the poker hardly seemed my own and might as well have been a log what do you think of that my cat what do you think of that my dog my clothes they were the queerest shape such coats and hats she never met my ways they were the oddest ways my friends were such a vulgar set poor tomkinson was snubbed and huffed she could not bear that mr blog what do you think of that my cat what do you think of that my dog at times we had a spar and then mamma must mingle in the song the sister took a sister's part the maid declared a master wrong the parrot learned to call me fool my life was like a london fog what do you think of that my cat what do you think of that my dog my susan's taste was super fine as proved by bills that had no end i never had a decent coat i never had a coin to spend she forced me to resign my club lay down my pipe retrench my grog what do you think of that my cat what do you think of that my dog each sunday night we gave a rout to fops and flirts a pretty list 
and when i tried to steal away i found my study full of whist then first to come and last to go there always was a captain hogg what do you think of that my cat what do you think of that my dog now was that not an awful dream for one who single is and snug with pussy in the elbow chair and try reposing on the rug if i must totter down the hill tis safest done without a clog what do you think of that my cat what do you think of that my dog end of poem this recording is in the public domain rural felicity by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by anthony gurgis rural felicity well the country's a pleasant place sure enough for people that's country born and useful no doubt in a natural way for growing our grass and our corn it was kindly meant of my cousin giles to write and invite me down though as yet all i've seen of a pastoral life only makes one more partial to town at first i thought i was really come down into all sorts of rural bliss for porkington place with all its cows and its pigs and its poultry looks not much amiss there's something about a dairy farm with its different kinds of livestock that puts one in mind of paradise and adam and his innocent flock but somehow the good elysium fields that have not been well handed down and as yet i have found no fields to prefer to dear lester fields up in town to be sure it is pleasant to walk in the meads and so i should like for miles if it wasn't for clodpoles of carpenters that put up such crooked styles for the bars jut out and you must jut out till you're almost broken in two if you clamber you're certain sure of a fall and you stick if you try to creep through of course in the end one learns how to climb without constant tumbles down but still as to walking so stylishly it's pleasanter done about town there's a way i know to avoid the styles and that's by a walk in a lane and i did find a very nice shady one but i never dared go again for who should i meet but a rampaging bull that wouldn't be kept in the pound a trying to toss the whole world at once by sticking his horns in the ground and that by the by is another thing that pulls rural pleasures down every day in the country is cattle day and there's only two up in town then I've rose with the sun to go brushing away at the first early pearly dew, and to meet Ori and whatever's her name, and I always got wetted through. My shoes are like sops, and I caught a bad cold and a nice draggle tail to my gown. That's not the way that we bathe our feet or wear our pearls up in town. As for picking flowers, I have tried at a hedge sweet eglantine roses to snatch. But mercy on us, how nettles will sting, and how the long brambles do scratch besides hitching my hat on a nasty thorn that tore all the boughs from the crown one may walk long enough without hats branching off or losing one boughs about town but worse than that in a long rural walk suppose that it blows up for rain and all at once you discover yourself in a real saint swithin's lane and while you're running all ducked and drowned and pelted with sixpenny drops fine weather you hear the farmers say a nice growing shower for the crops but who's to crop me another new hat or grow me another new gown for you can't take a shilling fare with a plough as you do with the hackneys in town then my nevies too they must drag me off to go with them gathering nuts and we always set out by the longest way and return by the shortest cuts short cuts indeed but it's nuts to them to get a poor lustylish ant to scramble through gaps or jump over a dish when they're morally certain she can't for whenever i get in some awkward scrape and it's almost daily the case though they don't laugh out the mischievous brats i see the hurray in their face there's the other day for my sight is short and i saw what was green beyond and thought it was all terry firmer in grass till i walked in the duckweed pond or perhaps when i've pulley hauled up a bank they see me come launching down as none but a stout london female can do as is come a first time out of town then how sweet some say on a mossy bank a virtuous seat to find but for my part i always found a joy that brought a repentance behind for the juicy grass with its nasty green has stained the whole breadth of my gown and when gowns are dyed i needn't say it's much better than up in town as for country fare the first morning i came i heard such a shrill piece of work and ever since and it's ten days ago we've lived upon nothing but pork 
one sunday except and then i turned sick a plague take all countrified cooks why they didn't tell me before i had died they made pigeon pies of the rooks then the gooseberry wine though it's pleasant when up it doesn't agree when it's down but it served me right like a gooseberry fool to look for champagne out of town to be sure cousin g meant it all for the best when he started this pastoral plan and his wife is a worthy domestical soul and she teaches me all that she can such as making of cheese and curing of hams but i'm sure that i never shall learn and i fetched more backache than butter as yet by chumping away at the churn but in making hay though it's tanning work i found it more easy to make but it tries one legs and no great relief when you're tired to sit down on the rake i'd a country dance too at harvest home with a regular country clown but lord they don't hug one around the waist and give one such smacks in town then i've tried to make friends with the birds and the beasts but they take to such curious rigs i'm always at odds with the turkey cock and i can't even please the pigs the very hens pick holes in my hands when i grope for the new laid eggs and the gander comes hissing out of the pond on purpose to flap at my legs i've been bumped in a ditch by the cow without horns and the old so trampled me down the beasts are as vicious as any wild beast but they're kept in cages in town another thing is the nasty dogs through the village i can hardly stir since giving the bumpkin a pint of beer just to call off a barking cur and now you would swear all the dogs in the place were set on to hunt me down but neither the brutes nor the people i think are as civilly bred as in town last night about twelve i was scared brought awake and all in a tremble of fright but instead of a family murder it proved an owl that flies screeching at night then there's plenty of ricks and stacks all about and i can't help dreaming of swing in short i think that a pastoral life is not the most happiest thing for besides all the troubles i've mentioned before as endured for rurality's sake i've been stung by the bees and i've set among the ants and once ugh i trod on a snake and as mosquitoes they tortured me so for i've got particular skin i do think it's the gnats coming out of the pond that drives the poor suicides in and after all ain't there new laid eggs to be had upon holborn hill and dairy fed pork in broad street giles and fresh butter wherever you will and a covered cart that brings cottage bread quite rustical like and brown so one isn't so uncountrified in the very heart of the town howsoever my mind's made up and although i'm sure cousin giles will be vexed i meant to book me an inside place up to town upon saturday next and if nothing happens soon after ten i shall be at the old bell and crown and perhaps i may come to the country again when london is all burnt down end of poem this recording is in the public domain a flying visit by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by anthony gergis a flying visit a calendar a calendar look in the almanac find out moonshine find out moonshine midsummer night's dream the bygone september as folks may remember at least if their memory saves but an ember one fine afternoon there went up a balloon which did not return to the earth very soon for nearing the sky at about a mile high the aeronaut bold had resolved on a fly so cutting his string in a parasol thing down he came in a field like a lark from the wing meanwhile thus adrift the balloon made a shift to rise very fast with no burden to lift it got very small then to nothing at all and then rose the question of where it would fall some thought that for lack of the man and his pack twould rise to the cherub that watches poor jack some held but in vain with the very first rain twould surely come down to the gardens again but still not a word for a month could be heard of what had become of the wonderful bird the firm guy and hughes wore their boots out and shoes and running about and inquiring for news some thought it must be tumbled into the sea some thought it had gone off to high germany for germans as shown by their writings to stone are always delighted with what is high flown some hinted a bilk and that maidens who milk in far distant shires would be walking in silk some swore that it must as they said at the fust have gone again flashes of lightning and bust however at last when six weeks had gone past intelligence came of a plausible cast a wandering clown at a hamlet near town had seen like a moon of green cheese coming down soon spread the alarm and from cottage and farm the natives buzzed out like the bees when they swarm 
and off ran the folk like it is a good joke to see the descent of a bag full of smoke and lo the machine dappled yellow and green was plainly enough in the clouds to be seen yes yes was the cry it's the old one sure lie where can it have been such a time in the sky lord where will it fall it can't find out vauxhall without any pilot to guide it at all some wagered that kent would behold the event de barrett had been proposed to predict its descent some thought it would pitch in the old tower ditch some swore on the cross of st paul's it would hitch and farmers cried zounds if it drops on our grounds we'll try if balloons can't be put into pounds and still to and fro it continued to go as if looking out for soft places below no difficult job it had only to bob slap dash down at one of the heads of the mob who too apt to stare at some castle in the air forgot that the earth is their proper affair till watching the fall of some soap bubble ball they tumble themselves with a terrible sprawl meanwhile from its height stooping downward in flight the phenomenon came more distinctly in sight still bigger and bigger and strike me a nigger unfreed if there was not a live human figure yes plain to be seen underneath the machine there dangled a mortal some swore it was green some mason could spy others named mr guy or holland compelled by the belgians to fly twas graham the flightly whom the duke high and mighty resigned to take care of his own ligum vitae twas hampton whose whim was in the cloudland to swim to lean little hampton looked little to him but all were at fault from the heavenly vault the flying balloon came at last to a halt and bounced with a jar of descending so far an outlandish creature was flown from the car at first with a jolt all his wits made a bolt as if he'd been flung by a meddlesome colt and while in his faint to avoid all complaint the muse shall endeavour his portrait to paint the face of this elf round a splatter of delf was pale as if only a cast of itself his head had a rare fleece of silvery hair just like the albino at bartlemy fair his eyes they were odd like the eyes of a cod and gave him the look of a watery god his nose was a snub under which for his grub was a round open mouth like that of a chub his person was small without figure at all a plump little body as round as a ball with two little fins and a couple of pins with which had been christened a bow in the shins his dress it was new a full suit of sky blue with bright silver buckles in each little shoe thus painted complete from his head to his feet conceive him laid flat in squire hopkins's wheat fine text for the crowd who disputed aloud what sort of the creature had dropped from the cloud he's come from overseas he's a cochin chinese by jingo he's one of the wild cherokees don't nobody know he's a young eskimo turned white like the hares by the arctical snow some angel my dear sent from the upper spear for plum tree or egg new too good for this here meanwhile with a sigh having opened one eye the stranger rose up on his seat and by and finding his tongue thus he said or he sung me cricky bobiga me kickity bunk lord what does he speak it's dog latin it's greek it's some sort of slang for to puzzle a beak it's no like scotch said a scot on the watch for it's nothing like that but a kind of hotchpotch it's not parley vu cried a schoolboy or two nor hebrew at all said a wandering jew some said it was sprung from the irvington tongue the same that is used by a child very young some guessed at high dutch other thought it had much in sound of the true hokey pokeyish touch but none could be pause what the dickens not boss no mortal could tell what the dickens it was when who should come pat in a moment like that but boring to see what the people were at a doctor well able without any fable to talk and translate all the babble of babel so just drawing near with the vigilant ear that took every syllable in very clear before one could sip up a tumbler of flip he knew the whole tongue from the root to the tip then stretching his hand as you see daniel stand in the feast of belshazzar that picture so grand without more delay in the hamilton way he englished whatever the elf had to say crack a ban i'm the lunatic man confirmed in the moon since creation began sit muggy big bog whatever except in a fog you see with a lanthorn a bush and a dog lend scenery leer for this many a year i've longed to drop in at your own little sphere ok bad madaroon till one fine afternoon i found that wind coach on the horns of the moon cash quo but besides you must know i'd heard of the profiting prophet below big bother thumb blither who pretended to gather the ticks of the moon meant to play with in the weather so christmas and crash being shortish of cash i thought i had a right to partake of the hash silk muslin smack so i come with a pack to sell to the trade of my own almanac tis babbery partial besides ames commercial much wishing to honour my friend sir john herschel come pudding and tame it's inscribed to his name which is now at the full in celestial fame what wept and we swept 
wept pray this copy accept but here on the stranger some kidnappers leapt for why a shrewd man had devised the sly plan the wonder to grab for a show caravan so plotted so done with a flight as in fun while mock puglistical grounds were begun a knave who could box and give right and left knocks caught hold of the prize but his silvery locks and hard he had fared but the people were scared by what the interpreter roundly declared you ignorant turks you will be your own burks he holds all the keys of the lunary works you'd best let him go if you keep him below the moon will not change and the tides will not flow he left her at full and with such a long pull sounds every jack will run mad like a bull so awful a threat took effect on the set the frights though were more than their guests could forget so taking a jump in the car he became plump and threw all the ballast tried right out in the lump up soared the machine with its yellow and green but still the pale face of the creature was seen who cried from the car damn me organ bar that is what a sad set of villains you are Howbeit at some height he threw down a flight of almanacs wishing to set us all right, and that to the boon we shall see very soon if Murphy knows most or the man in the moon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Queen Mab by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway. Fourth of December. 2016 Kent A little fairy comes at night Her eyes are blue, her hair is brown With silver spots upon her wings And from the moon she flutters down She has a little silver wand And when a good child goes to bed She weaves her wand from right to left and makes a circle round its head. And then it dreams of pleasant things, of fountains filled with fairy fish, and trees that bear delicious fruit, and bow their branches at a wish, of arbours filled with dainty scents, from lovely flowers that never fade, bright flies that glitter in the sun, and glowworms shining in the shade and talking birds with gifted tongues for singing songs and telling tales and pretty dwarfs to show the way through fairy hills and fairy dales but when a bad child goes to bed from left to right she weaves her rings and then it dreams all through the night of only ugly horrid things the lions come with glaring eyes and tigers growl and dreadful noise, and ogres draw their cruel knives to shed the blood of girls and boys. Then stormy waves rush on to drown, or raging flames come scorching round, fierce dragons hover in the air, and serpents crawl along the ground. Then wicked children wake and weep, and wish the long black gloom away, but good ones love the dark and find the night as pleasant as the day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Henrietta by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. To Henrietta, on her departure for Calais. When little people go abroad, wherever they may roam, they will not just be treated as they used to be at home. So take a few promiscuous hints to warn you in advance of how a little English girl will perhaps be served in France. Of course you will be Frenchified, at first it is my belief they'll dress you in their foreign style as a la mode as beef with a little row of beehives as a border to your frock and a pair of frilly trousers like a little bantam cock but first they'll seize your bundle if you have one in a crack and tie it with a tape by way of bustle on your back and make your waist so high or low your shape will be a riddle for anyhow you'll never have 
your middle in the middle your little english sandals for a while will hold together but woe betide you when the stones have worn away the leather for they'll poke your little pity toes and there will be a hobble in such a pair of shoes as none but carpenters can cobble what next to fill your head with french to match the native girls in scraps of galianti they'll screw up your little curls and they'll take your nouns and verbs and some bits of verse and prose and pour them in your ears that you may spout them through your nose you'll have to learn a shoe is quite another sort of thing to that you put your foot in that a bell is not to ring that a corn is not the nubble that brings trouble to your toes nor putatra a potato as some irish folks suppose no no they have no murphys there for supper or for lunch but you may get in course of time a palm de terre to munch with which as you perforce must do as calais folk are doing you may be have to gobble up the frog that went a wooing but pray at meals remember this the french are so polite no matter what you eat or drink whatever is is right so when you're told at dinner time that some delicious stew is cat instead of rabbit you must answer taunt me ooh for little folks who go abroad wherever they may roam they cannot just be treated as they used to be at home so take a few promiscuous hints to warn you in advance of how a little english girl will perhaps be served in france End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Parthian Glance by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Sweet memory wafted by thy gentle gale, oft up the stream of time I turn my sail. Rogers. Come, my crony, let's think upon faraway days, and lift up a little oblivion's veil. Let's consider the past with a lingering gaze, like a peacock whose eyes are inclined to his tail. Ay, come, let us turn our attention behind, like those critics whose heads are so heavy. I fear they cannot keep up with the march of the mind, and so turn face about for reviewing the rear looking over time's crupper and over his tail oh what ages and pages there are to revise and as farther out our back searching glances prevail like the emmets how little we are in your eyes what a sweet petty innocent half a yard long on a dimity lap of true nursery make i can fancy i hear the old lullaby song that was meant to compose me but kept me awake methinks i still suffer the infantine throes when my flesh was a cushion for any long pen whilst they patted my body to comfort my woes oh how little they dreamt they were driving them in infant sorrows are strong infant pleasures as weak but no grief was allowed to indulge in its note did you ever attempt a small bubble and squeak through the dalby's carminative down in your throat did you ever go up to the roof with a bounce? Did you ever come down to the floor with the same? Oh, I can't but agree with bath ends and pronounce heads or tails with a child an unpleasantish gain. Then a urchin, I see myself urchin indeed, with a smooth Sunday face for a mother's delight. Why should weeks have an end? I am sure there was need of a Sabbath to follow each Saturday night was your face ever sent to the household to scrub have you ever felt huckaback softened with sand had you ever your nose toweled up to a snub and your eyes knuckled out with the back of the hand then a schoolboy my tailor was nothing in fault for an urchin will grow to a lad by degrees but how well i remember that pepper and salt 
that was down to the elbows and up to the knees. What a figure it cut when, as Norval, I spoke, with a lanky right leg duly planted before, whilst I told the chief that was killed by my stroke, and extended my arms as the arms that he wore. Next a lover, oh, oh, say, were you ever in love? With a lady too cold, and on your bosom too hot? Have you bowed to a shoe-tie and knelt to a glove, like a bow that desired to be tied in a knot? With the bride all in white in your body in blue, did you walk up the aisle, the genteelest of men? When I think of that beautiful vision in you, oh, I seem but the biffin of what I was then. I am withered and worn by a premature care, and wrinkles confess the decline of my days. Old time's busy hand has made free with my hair, and I'm seeking to hide it by writing for bays. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A True Story by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Gloria K. Ave, March 2018 Of all our pains since man was cursed, I mean a body, not the mental, to name the worst among the worst, the dental, sure, is transcendental. Some bit of masticating bone that ought to help to clear a shelf, but lets its proper work alone, and only seems to gnaw itself. In fact, of any grave attack on victual, there is little danger. Tis so like coming to the rack, as well as going to the manger. Old hunks, it seemed a fit retort of justice on his grinding ways, possessed a grinder of the sort that troubled all his latter days. The best of friends fall out, and so his teeth had done some years ago, save some old stumps with ragged root, and they took turn about to shoot. If he drank any chilly liquor, they made it quite a point to throb, but if he warmed it on the hob, why, then, they only twitched the quicker. One tooth, I wonder such a tooth had never killed him in his youth. One tooth he had with many fangs that shot at once as many pangs. It had a universal sting. One touch of that ecstatic stump could jerk his limbs and make him jump, just like a puppet on a string. And what was worse than all, it had a way of making others bad. There is as many know a knack with certain farming undertakers, and this same tooth pursued their track by adding acres still to acres. One way there is that has been judged a certain cure, but Hunks was loath to pay the fee and quite begrudged to lose his tooth and money both. In fact, a dentist and the wheel of fortune are a kindred cast, for after all is drawn you feel its pain for a blank at last. So Hunks went on from week to week and kept his torment in his cheek. Oh, how it sometimes set him rocking with that perpetual gnaw, gnaw, gnaw. His moans and groans were truly shocking and loud, although he held his jaw. Many a tug he gave his gum and tooth, but still it would not come. Though tied to string by some firm thing, he could not draw it do his best by drawers, although he tried a chest. At last, but after much debating, he joined a score of mouths in waiting like his to have their troubles out. Sad sight it was to look about at twenty faces, making faces with many a rampant trick and antic, for all were very horrid cases, and made their owners nearly frantic. A little wicked now and then took one of these unhappy men, and out again the victim rushed, while eyes and mouths together gushed. At last arrived our hero's turn, who plunged his hands in both his pockets, and down he sat, prepared to learn how teeth are charmed to quit their sockets. Those who have felt such operations alone can guess the sort of ache, when his old tooth began to break the thread of old associations. It touched a string in every part. It had so many tender ties. One cord seemed wrenching at his heart, and two were tugging at his eyes. Bone of his bone, he felt, of course, as husbands do in such divorce. At last the fangs gave way a little. Hunks gave his head a backward jerk, and lo, the cause of all this work went where it used to send his victual. 
the monstrous pain of this proceeding had not so numbed his miser wit but in this slip he saw a hit to save at least his purse from bleeding so when the dentist sought his fees quoth hunks let's finish if you please how finish why it's out oh no tis you are out to argue so i'm none of your beforehand tippers my tooth is in my head no doubt but as you say you pulled it out of course it's there between your nippers zounds sir do you think i'd sell the truth to get a fee no wretch i scorn it but hunks still asked to see the tooth and swore by gum he had not drawn it his end obtained he took his leave a secret chuckle in his sleeve the joke was worthy to produce when to think by favour of his wit how well a dentist had been bit by one old stump and that a loose one the thing was worth a laugh but mirth is still the frailest thing on earth alas how often when a joke seems in our sleeve and safe enough there comes some unexpected stroke and hangs a weeper on the cuff hunks had not whistled half a mile when planted right against a stile there stood his foeman mike mahoney a vagrant reaper irish born that helped to reap our miser's corn but had not helped to reap his money a fact that hunks remembered quickly his whistle all at once was quelled and when he saw how michael held his sickle he felt rather sickly nine souls in ten with half his fright would soon have paid the bill at sight but misers let observers watch it will never part with their delight till well demanded by a hatchet they live hard and they die to match it thus hunks prepared for mike's attacking resolved not yet to pay the debt but let him take it out in hacking however mike began to stickle in words before he used the sickle but mercy was not long attendant from words at last he took to blows and aimed a cut at hunks's nose that made it what some folks are not a member very independent heaven knows how far this cruel trick might still have led but for a tramper that came in danger's very nick to put mahoney to the scamper but still compassion met a damper there lay the severed nose alas beside the daisies on the grass we crimson tipped as well as they according to the poet's lay and there stood hunks no sight for laughter away went hodge to get assistance with nose in hand which hunks ran after but somewhat at unusual distance in many a little country place it is a very common case to have but one residing doctor whose practice rather seems to be no practice but a rule of three physician surgeon drug decoctor thus hunks was forced to go once more where he had taken his two tea before his mere name made the learned man hot what hunks again within my door i'll pull his nose quoth hunks you cannot the doctor looked and saw the case plain as the nose not on his face oh am i yes i understand but then arose a long demur for not a finger would he stir till he was paid his fee in hand that matter settled there they were with hunks well strapped upon his chair the opening of a surgeon's job his tools a chestful or a drawer full are always something very awful and give the heart the strangest throb but never patient in his funks looked half so like a ghost as hunks or surgeon half so like a devil prepared from some infernal revel his huge black eye kept rolling rolling just like a bolus in a box his fury seemed above controlling he bellowed like a hunted ox now swindling wretch i'll show thee how we treat such cheating knaves as thou oh sweet is this revenge to sup i have thee by the nose it's now my turn and i will turn it up guess how the miser liked the scurvy and cruel way of venting passion the snubbing folks in this new fashion seemed quite to turn him topsy-turvy he uttered prayers and groans and curses for things had often gone amiss and wrong with him before but this would be the worst of all reverses in fancy he beheld his snout turned upwards like a pitcher's spout there was another grievance yet and fancy did not fail to show it that he must throw a somerset or stand upon his head to blow it and was there then no argument to change the doctor's vile intent and move his pity yes in truth and that was pain for the tooth 
zounds pay for such a stump i'd rather but here the menace went no farther for with his other ways of pinching hunks had a miser's love of snuff a recollection strong enough to cause a very serious flinching in short he paid and had the feature replaced as it was meant by nature for though by this twas cold to handle no corpses could have felt so horrid and white just like a naked candle the doctor deemed and proved it too that noses from the nose will do as well as noses from the forehead so fixed by din of rag and lint the part was bandaged up and muffled the chair unfastened hunks rose and shuffled off for once unshuffled and as he went these words he snuffled well this is pain through the nose end of poem this recording is in the public domain the mermaid of margate by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by gloria keave march 2018 alas what perils do environ that man who meddles with a siren hudibras on margate beach where the sick one roams and the sentimental reads where the maiden flirts and the widow comes like the ocean to cast her weeds where urchins wander to pick up shells and the sit to spy at the ships like the water gala at sadler's wells and the chandler for watery dips there's a maiden sits by the ocean brim as lovely and fair as sin but woe deep water and woe to him that she snareth like peter finn her head is crowned with pretty sea wares and her locks are golden loose and seek to her feet like other folks heirs to stand of course in her shoes and all day long she combeth them well with a sea shark's prickly jaw and her mouth is just like a rose-lipped shell the fairest the man ever saw and the fishmonger humble as love may be hath planted his seat by her side good even fair maid is thy lover at sea to make thee so watch the tide she turned about with her pearly brows and clasped him by the hand come love with me i've a bonny house on the golden goodwin sand and then she gave him a siren kiss no honeycomb air was sweeter poor wretch how little he dreamt for this that peter should be salt peter and away with her prize to the wave she leapt not walking as damsels do with toe and heel as she ought to have stepped but she hopped like a kangaroo one plunge and then the victim was blind whilst they galloped across the tide at last on the bank he waked in his mind and the beauty was by his side one half on the sand and half in the sea but his hair began to stiffen for when he looked where her feet should be she had no more feet than miss biffin but a scaly tail of a dolphin's growth in the dabbling brine did soak at last she opened her pearly mouth like an oyster and thus she spoke you crimped my father who was a skate and my sister you sold a maid so here remain for a fishery fate for lost you are and betrayed and away she went with a seagull scream and a splash of her saucy tail in a moment he lost the silvery gleam that shone on her splendid mail the sun went down with a blood-red flame and the sky grew cloudy and black and the tumbling billows like leapfrog came each over the other's back ah me it had been a beautiful scene with a safe terra firma round but the green water hillocks all seemed to him like those in a churchyard ground and christians love in the turf to lie not in watery graves to be nay the very fishes will sooner die on the land than in the sea and whiles he stood the watery strife encroached on every hand and the ground decreased his moments of life seemed measured like times by sand and still the waters foamed in like ale in front and on either flank he knew that goodwin and company must fail there was such a run on the bank a little more and a little more the surges came tumbling in he sang the evening hymn twice o'er and thought of every sin each flounder in place lay cold at his heart as cold as his marble slab 
and he thought he felt in every part the pincers of scalded crab. The squealing lobsters that he had boiled, and the little potted shrimps, all the horny prawns he had ever spoiled, gnawed into his soul like imps. And the billows were wandering to and fro, and the glorious sun was sunk, and day getting black in the face as though of the nightshade she had drunk. Had there been but a smuggler's cargo adrift, one tub or keg to be seen, it might have given his spirits a lift or an anchor where hope might lean. But there was not a box or a beam afloat to raft him from that sad place, not a skiff, not a yawl, or a mackerel boat, nor a smack upon Neptune's face. At last, his lingering hopes to boy, he saw a sail and a mast, and called ahoy, but it was not ahoy, and so the vessel went past. And with saucy wing that flapped in his face, the wild bird about him flew, with a shrilly scream that twitted his case, why, thou art a seagull too. And lo, the tide was over his feet. Oh, his heart began to freeze and slowly to pulse. In another beat, the wave was up to his knees. He was deafened amidst the mountain tops, and the salt spray blinded his eyes and washed away the other salt drops that grief had caused to arise. But just as his body was all afloat and the surges above him broke, he was saved from the hungry deep by a boat of deal, but builded of oak. The skipper gave him a dram as he lay and chafed his shivering skin, and the angel returned that was flying away with the spirit of Peter Finn. End of poem. This reading is in the public domain. A Fairy Tale by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Gloria Keave, March 2018 On Hanselow Heath, and close beside the road, as western travellers may oft have seen, a little house some years ago there stood, a minikin abode, and built like Mr. Birkbeck's olive wood, the walls of white, the window shutters green. Four wheels it had at north, south, east, and west, though now at rest, on which it used to wander to and fro, because its master ne'er maintained a rider like those who trade in Paternoster Row, but made his business travel for itself till he had made his pelf, and then retired, if one may call it so, of a roadsider. Perchance the very race and constant riot of stages, long and short, which thereby ran, made him more relish the repose and quiet of his now sedentary caravan. Perchance he loved the ground because twas common, and so he might impale a strip of soil that furnished, by his toil, some dusty greens for him and his old woman. And five tall hollyhocks in dingy flower, howbeit the thoroughfare did no way spoil his peace, unless in some unlucky hour a stray horse came and gobbled up his bower. But, tired of always looking at the coaches, the same to come, when they had seen them one day, and used to brisker life, both man and wife began to suffer N.U.E.'s approaches, and feel retirement like a long, wet Sunday. So, having had some quarters of school breeding, they turn themselves, like other folks, to reading. But setting out where others nigh have done, and being ripened in the seventh state, the childhood of old age, began as other children have begun. Not with the pastorals of Mr. Pope, or Bard of Hope, or Paley Ethical, or Learned Porson, but spelt on Sabbaths in St. Mark or John, and then relaxed themselves with Whittington or Valentine and Orson, but chiefly fairy tales they loved to con, and being easily melted in their dotage, slobbered and kept reading, and wept over the white cat in their wooden cottage. Thus reading on, the longer they read, of course their childish faith grew stronger, in gnomes and hags and elves and giants grim. If talking trees and birds revealed to him, she saw the flight of fairylands fly wagons, and magic fishes swim in puddle ponds, and took old crows for dragons. Both were quite drunk from the enchanted flagons. 
when as it fell upon a summer's day as the old man sat a feeding on the old babe reading beside his open street and parlor door a hideous roar proclaimed a drove of beasts was coming by the way long-horned and short of many a different breed tall tawny brutes from famous lincoln levels or durham feed with some of those unquiet black dwarf devils from nether side of tweed or firth of forth looking half wild with joy to leave the north with dusty hides all mobbing on together when whether from a fly's malicious comment upon his tender flank from which he shrank or whether only in some enthusiastic moment however one brown monster in a frisk giving his tail a perpendicular whisk kicked out a passage through the beastly rabble and after a pasol or if you will a hornpipe before the basket maker's villa leapt over the tiny pail backed his beefsteaks against the wooden gable and thrust his brawny bell rope of a tail right o'er the page wherein the sage just then was spelling some romantic fable the old man half a scholar half a dunce could not peruse who could two tales at once and being huffed at what he knew was none of riquet's tuft banged to the door but most unluckily enclosed a morsel of the intruding tail in all the tassel the monster gave a roar and bolting off with speed increased by pain the little house became a coach once more and like macheath took to the road again just then by fortune's whimsical decree the ancient woman stooping with her crupper towards sweet home or where sweet home should be was getting up some household herbs for supper thoughtful of cinderella in the tale and quaintly wondering if magic shifts could o'er a common pumpkin so prevail to turn it into a coach what pretty gifts might come of cabbages and curly kale meanwhile she never heard her old man's wail nor turn till home had turned a corner quite gone out of sight at last conceive her rising from the ground weary of sitting on her russet clothing and looking round where rest was to be found there was no house no villa there no nothing no house the change was quite amazing it made her senses stagger for a minute the riddle's explication seemed to harden, but soon her superannuated new explained the horrid mystery, and raising her hand to heaven with the cabbage in it, on which she meant to sup. Well, this is fairy work. I'll bet a farden little Prince Silverwings has catched me up and set me down in someone else's garden. End of poem. This reading is in the public domain. Craniology by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Tis strange how like a very dunce Man with his bumps upon his sconce Has lived so long, and yet no knowledge he has had Till lately of phrenology a science that by simple dint of head combing he should find a hint of when scratching o'er those little pole hills the faculties throw up like mole hills a science that in very spite of all his teeth ne'er came to light for though he knew his skull had grinders still there turned up no organ finders still sages wrote and ages fled and no man's head came in his head not even the pate of era potter knew aught about his pia mater at last great dr gall bestirs him i don't know but it might be spurs him though native of dull and slow land and makes partition of our pole land at our acquisitiveness guesses and all those necessary nesses indicative of human habits all burrowing in the head like rabbits thus veneration he made known he got a lodging at the crown and music see deville's example a set of chambers in the temple that language taught the tongues close by and took in pupils through the eye close by his neighbor computation who taught the eyebrows numeration the science thus to speak in fit terms 
having struggled from its knit was seized on by a swarm of scotchmen those scientifical hotchpotch men who have at least a penny dip and wallop in the doctorship just as in making broth they smatter by bobbing twenty things in water these men i say made quick appliance and close to phrenologic science for of all learned themes whatever that school and colleges deliver there's none they love so near the bodies as analyzing their own noddles thus in a trice each northern blockhead had got his fingers in his shockhead and of his bumps was babbling yet worse than poor miss capulet's dry wet nurse till having been sufficient rangers of their own heads they took to strangers and found a presbyterian's poles the things they hated in their souls for presbyterians here with passion of organs joined with their veneration no kind there was of human pumpkin but at its bumps it had a pumpkin down to the very lowest gullion an oiliest skull of oily scullion no great man died but this they did do they begged his cranium from his widow no murderer died by law disaster but they took off his sconce and plaster for thereon they could show depending the head in front of his offending how that his philanthropic bump was mastered by a baser lump but every bump these wags insist has its direct antagonist each striving stoutly to prevail like horses knotted tail to tail and many a stiff and sturdy battle occurs between these adverse cattle the secret cause beyond all question of aches ascribed to indigestion whereas tis but two knobby rivals tugging together like sheer devils till one gets mastery good or sinister and comes in like a new prime minister each bias in some master node is what makes madam where a road is to hammer little pebbles less his organ of destructiveness what makes great joseph so encumber debate a lumping lump of number or malthus rail at babies so and the smallest of his philopro what severs man and wife a simple defect of the adhesive pimple or makes weak women go astray their bumps are more in fault than they these facts being found and set in order by grave m d s beyond the border to make them for some months eternal were entered monthly in a journal that many a northern sage still writes in and throws his little northern lights in and proves and proves about the frenus a great deal more than i or he knows how music suffers par example by wearing tight hats round the temple what ills great boxers have to fear from blisters put behind the ear and how a porter's veneration is hurt by porter's occupation whether shillelaghs in reality may deaden individuality or tongs and poker be creative of alterations in the imative if falls from scaffolds make us less inclined to all constructiveness with more such matters all applying to heads and therefore headifying end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Wee Man, A Romance by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 29th of December, 2016 Kent It was a merry company And they were just afloat When lo, a man of dwarfish span Came up and held the boat Good morrow to you gentle folks And will you let me in? A slender space will serve my case, for I am small and thin. They saw he was a dwarfish man, and very small and thin. Not seven such would matter much, and so they took him in. They laughed to see his little hat, with such a narrow brim. They laughed to note his dapper coat, with skirts so scant and trim. But barely had they gone a mile, when gravely one and all at once began to think the man was not so very small. His coat had got a broader skirt, his hat a broader brim, his leg grew stout and soon plumped out, a very proper limb. 
Still on they went, and as they went, more rough the billows grew, and rose and fell a greater swell, and he was swelling too. And lo, where room had been for seven, for six there scarce was space, for five, for four, for three not more, than two could find a place. There was not even room for one, they crowded by degrees, aye, closer yet, till elbows met, and knees were jogging knees. Good sir, you must not sit astern, the wave will else come in. Without a word he gravely stirred, another seat to win. Good sir, the boat has lost her trim, you must not sit a lee. With smiling face and courteous grace, the middle seat took he. But still, by constant quiet growth, his back became so white, each neighbour white, to left and right, was thrust against the side. Lord, how they chided with themselves that they had let him in, to see him grow so monstrous now, that came so small and thin. On every brow a dewdrop stood, they grew so scared and hot. I the name of all that's great and tall, who are you, sir, and what? Loud laughed the gogmagog a laugh, as loud as giants roar. When first I came, my proper name was little, now I'm more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Progress of Art by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo The Progress of Art O oh, happy time, art's early days, When o'er each deed, with sweet self-praise, Narcissus-like I hung, When great Rembrandt but little seemed, And such old masters all were deemed As nothing to the young. Some scratchy strokes, abrupt and few, so easily and swift I drew, sufficed for my design. My sketchy superficial hand drew solids at a dash and spanned a surface with a line. Not long my eye was thus content, but grew more critical, my bent, essayed a higher walk. I copied leaden eyes and lead, rheumatic hands in white and red, and gouty feet in chalk. Anon my studious art for days kept making faces, happy phrase, for faces such as mine. Accomplished in the details then, I left the minor parts of men, and drew the form divine. Old gods and heroes, Trojan, Greek, figures, long after the antique, great Ajax justly feared, Hectors, of whom at night I dreamt, in Nestor fringed enough to tempt, furred Nestor's to his beard. A Bacchus leering on a bowl, a palace that outstared her owl, a Vulcan very lame, a Diane stuck about with stars, with my right hand I murdered Mars, one Williams did the same. But tired of this dry work at last, crayon and chalk aside I cast, and gave my brush a drink, dipping as when a painter dips in gloom of earthquake and eclipse, that is, in Indian ink. Oh, then, what black Mont Blancs arose, crested with soot and not with snows, what clouds of dingy hue! In spite of what the bard has penned, I fear the distance did not lend enchantment to the view. Not Radcliffe's brush did e'er design black forests half so black as mine, or lakes so like a pall. The Chinese cake dispersed a ray of darkness like the light of day, and Martin over all. Yet urchin pride sustained me still. I gazed on all with right good will and spread the dingy tint. No holy lute helped me to paint. The devil, surely, not a saint, had any finger in it. But colors came like morning light, with gorgeous hues displacing night, or springs enlivened scene. 
at once the sable shades withdrew my skies got very very blue my trees extremely green and washed by my cosmetic brush how beauty's cheek began to blush with lock of auburn stain not goldsmith's auburn not brown hair that made her loveliest of the fair not loveliest of the plain her lips were of vermilion hue love in her eyes and prussian blue set all my heart in flame a young pygmalion i adored the maids i made but time was stored with evil and it came perspective dawned and soon i saw my houses stand against its law and keeping all unkept my beauties were no longer things for love and fond imaginings but horrors to be wept ah why did knowledge ope my eyes why did i get more artist wise it only serves to hint what grave defects and wants are mine that i'm no hilton in design in nature no de wint thrice happy time art's early days when o'er each deed with sweet self-praise narcissus like i hung when great rembrandt but little seemed and such old masters all were deemed as nothing to the young and a poem this recording is in the public domain